Canada. Uh, my family are from the prairies originally. I was born on Treaty 6 territory in what's now Saskatoon, Saskatchewan. Uh, some of my ancestors are people from Norway, Ireland, and so forth. Some of them were Métis people. I uh, traced my ancestry back to... Hold on one second. Sorry, had a bit of a technical issue there. Um, today, we're going to be hearing from uh, two people who have uh, expertise in the issues around Indigenous fishing rights. Uh, we're hosting this from Vancouver uh, on the West Coast uh, at the Centre for Socialist Education on Clark Drive. Uh, so we are on the traditional unceded occupied territories of the Musqueam, the Tsleil-Waututh, the Squamish peoples. We extend our gratitude and our solidarity to them. Uh, we thank them for allowing us to use their, their beautiful lands to carry out our, uh, our political work here, our cultural activities. Uh, this is a great part of the world to be in, uh, but it's incumbent upon us to uh, defend these lands from the, uh, the corporate profiteers who are intent on destroying it, including destroying uh, the salmon fishery, which is crucial. Uh, to the peoples of the West Coast, the indigenous peoples who've lived here for many thousands of years, uh, carried on uh, their economies, their trading activity, their cultural activities, uh, of which uh, uh, the salmon fishery is a, an integral part, always has been. Ever since the European colonists came to this part of the world, uh, we all know stories of the destruction of the natural wealth uh, that, uh, that existed here on Turtle Island before European imperialism came to this part of the planet. Uh, the, uh, 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 the destruction of the salmon fishery is, is one of those stories. Uh, communists have been involved in the, the salmon fishing industry uh, since the 1800s, early 1900s, when this became a, a big capitalist industry. Uh, Communists were involved in organizing the United Fishermen and Allied Workers Union, uh, and some were also involved in organizations like the Native Brotherhood, which was the other major force in the salmon industry on, uh, on the West Coast among the fishermen. Uh, communists like Homer Stevens, who is the most prominent of them, were always finding ways to advocate for unity of the fishermen against the, uh, uh, the big fishing companies and to defend the salmon themselves uh, from the logging industry, which did so much to destroy the rivers and streams that the salmon need to, to migrate, to, uh, uh, to be able to, uh, to live their life cycles. Uh, the, uh, the United Fishermen under Homer Stevens and others uh, campaigned against things like the, uh, the open ocean fish farming, which began in the 1970s. They could see absolutely that this was a, a threat to the existence of the salmon runs on the West Coast. And we're seeing some of that play out today. One of our speakers, uh, Jim, will be talking about this and, and related issues. The federal government announced uh, a few months ago that the, the open pen fish farms in the Discovery Islands will be phased out. And this is a very important step to protect uh, the wild salmon in British Columbia uh, and all the different salmon runs out here. But it's creating a, uh, a racist backlash as well as people in that industry. Some of them are blaming indigenous peoples for threatening their livelihoods. Well, everybody knew uh, the indigenous folks, the communists, uh, the far-sighted leaders of the Fishermen's Union, uh, that the open pen, uh, the open sea, salmon uh, uh, pens were a threat to the existence of wild salmon and this day was always going to come. So I'm gonna stop at that. I'm gonna introduce Jim, uh, who's from a fishing family, an indigenous grassroots activist uh, uh, who knows a lot about this industry right from uh, the bottom up and, and has done a lot of study of, uh, of what's going on in the industry. Uh, after Jim has spoken, then we'll be 
hearing from Chris Fraser. I'll introduce Chris uh, after Jim's presentation. So uh, take it away, Jim. Thank you, Kimball. Um, yeah, I'm a grassroots organizer. Um, this is my second year grassroots organizing and I've had a lot of great experiences working alongside the Communist Party of Canada. I've, my background is 15 seasons of fishing. I've done mostly salmon, a little bit of halibut, but mostly salmon in my time. And uh, yeah, I'm looking forward to highlighting a lot of the history and the things that have gone wrong and the way that a lot of rich folks have been able to capitalize on Indigenous resources and really extract a lot of wealth that should be with the Indigenous people. Thank you. Uh, I'll just introduce Chris and then uh, we'll hear from each of you in, uh, in detail. Chris Fraser uh, is a professor at uh, St. of X University uh, in Nova Scotia, uh, where he has been involved in solidarity with the Mi'kmaq fishers who are struggling for their right to, to earn a living uh, in the lobster industry. Uh, but he's originally from the West Coast, uh, uh, from Vancouver Island, and uh, then grew up in Alberta, where I also grew up. Uh, uh, so we're both uh, very familiar with the mentality of uh, people who want <laughs> to uh, uh, extract the resources of this land, uh, uh, which were never uh, uh, the settlers really to take. Uh, and Chris, uh, 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 well, he, he has a long history of involvement in many types of, of solidarity struggles. He was the uh, the leader of the Young Communist League back in the 1980s, early 90s. Uh, in more recent years, he's prominent in, in various other struggles in, in Nova Scotia, uh, including uh, uh, activity in the LGBTQS communities. Uh, and uh, he, he can tell us a lot about the background of the struggles in the fishing industry, lobster fisheries in Nova Scotia. But first, we'll turn it back over to Jim. Uh, let's let's hear your thoughts on uh, the evolution of these struggles and issues on the West Coast. Okay, one second. I couldn't find the year of it. But um, originally, or like I couldn't find the year of when things started to escalate. But when the licenses first came out here, they were dirt cheap. Some of them you could get for 50 bucks. Some of them were free. And there was a limited supply of them, which they didn't know at the time. A lot of the people never bothered getting them because they thought it didn't matter. But over the years, due to the limited supply and due to the capitalist uh, unrelenting desire to extract wealth, they all got bought up and slowly but surely the price of them went up. And I think, if I'm not mistaken, the golden age of fishing was from the 70s to the 90s here. I could be completely mistaken about that, but as that happened, the, the price kept going up and up and up and cost for fishermen slowly went up and up and up. And as that happened, the corporations moved in. Jimmy Patterson was one of them. And the Weston family was really big before Jimmy Patterson. But they started buying up as many licenses as they could and built a corporate fleet. The, there's two, around my territory, there was two kinds of boats, two kinds of fisheries really. And it was the gillnet fishery and the seine fishery. And the gillnet fishery, it was really small. You had one boat, often it was operated by one person, but you could have up to three or four people on there if you really wanted to. But that was usually family oriented and it allowed um, families to attain a moderate livelihood. The second is the seine boats and the troller ships and the factory ships. And that's not really done by families. That's generally done by 
uh, people who have the experience and the time and the capital to lease that kind of a license. But what happened, I, I don't know what decade it happened, but the Jimmy Pattison was permitted to start buying the limited Gilnet licenses and he was able to fuse them, to combine them from three single family licenses to one SANE license. And with the SANE licenses, you can fish dozens and dozens of tons and catch amounts that no, no, uh, no fleet of gillnet fishermen could ever catch. But the way that's set up is that it's so centralized and it's so concentrated so that you only really have a few people who are benefiting from that extraction. You have the license holder who benefits the most, then you have the captain who leases, leases the license, and then you ha only have a few employees under you really. I think it's four or five maximum. So for, I don't know how many, how much weight, but hundreds of thousands of pounds of biomass being extracted, you only really have six or seven people benefiting. I'll uh, turn it over to Chris for now. Take it away, Chris. Tell us okay. something about the East Coast. Okay, well, um, <laughs> it's nice to be called uh, an expert. Um, I'm more an expert in, uh, in uh, uh, settler solidarity, let's just put it that way. Um, I'm not a, I'm not a, a fisher, and uh, so my knowledge of the industry um, is largely what I've learned in the course of uh, engaging in solidarity work with around this particular struggle, but I've learned a fair amount. So, um, so what I will do is just talk a little bit about what I know about the, the structure uh, of the fishing industry, particularly lobster, which is what has been the, at the heart of the struggle here. Um, and then to talk about some of the politics that, uh, that have gone along with some of that. So, uh, so it's been about the lobster fishing here in Nova Scotia and, uh, and about, uh, the assertion of the Mi'kmaq right to earn a uh, moderate livelihood from that fishing, uh, which was part of the negotiation of peace and friendship treaties between, uh, Mi'kmaq, um, people and the British crown way back in the 18th century. There were a series, in fact, of peace and friendship treaties that were signed. <clears throat> the ones that uh, that uh, affirmed uh, the um, th and were supposed to protect Mi'kmaq access to resources both on land and on the water uh, were negotiated in 1760 and 1761. <clears throat> uh, <clears throat> but the outcome of that, as we know, has um, has uh, I you know, deviated from the original intent. In any event, uh, about so there's the lobster fishing, and just for the help, for the sake of uh, of uh, being able to visualize the uh, sort of the scene of the crimes, if you will, um, literally the scenes of the crimes, uh, I'm going to just put up a bit of a map um, of the lobster fishing area, if that's okay, if I'm able to share my screen, I'm going to give, yeah, um, so uh, can't find my, my image, just give me a second here. Um, take your time, Chris. Yeah, well, I'll take my time for sure. Oh, there we go. I think I've got it now. All right. Yeah, there it is. Okay, uh, so I'm going to share. So this is uh, this is Nova Scotia here, Cape Breton uh, Island here. Uh, we have the two fisheries. One is the inshore fisheries, uh, and then the um, then the offshore fishery. So the um, the inshore fisheries are LFA uh, lobster fishing area 33, and then lobster fishing area 34. These are the areas that are fished by uh, individual commercial um, fishers, okay? Uh, this area here, uh, lobster fishing area 41, is licensed exclusively to the one uh, monopoly that operates um, on the offshore, uh, which is Clearwater Seafoods. 
which has been purchased recently in a uh, a pretty interesting maneuver by Mi'kmaq communities. They purchased Clearwater. Uh, so, um, and anyway, I'll come to that in a moment. But where all of this has been taking place is uh, it concerns lobster fishing area 34 here. So it's the inshore fishery. And the Department of Fisheries and Oceans has imposed for the commercial fishers at least uh, a fishing season. All right. So, uh, so the original complaint by the commercial fishers about the launch of the Mi'kmaq fishery was that they were fishing off season. Um, but the, uh, the fact of the matter is, is that access to, uh, to that resource is guaranteed already in treaty and has been affirmed by the Supreme Court of Canada with the Marshall decision in 1999. Uh, so there's really not uh, a legal uh, leg to stand on for opposing uh, the Mi'kmaq fishery, although um, that water is uh, being consistently muddied by the behavior of the Department of Fisheries and the minister herself. In any event, uh, the sort of the this is uh, where Digby County is located, right here on the uh, on the entrance to the Bay of Fundy. So uh, St. Mary's Harbor um, is uh, is in a place called Saulnierville, which is part of Digby County, and that's where most of the conflict has been happening. But there's also been some business up here um, in the uh, in the, uh, the Laurentian Strait, um, actually maybe a bit further north. Uh, Anyhow, uh, there's been some conflict there uh, with respect uh, it, it, that involves the Department of Fisheries only, and, and interestingly enough, not uh, not uh, a confrontation with commercial fishers. So, so that's the geography, um, and I will just say about uh, this first, and then I'll talk about um, the actual conflict in LFA 34. Uh, but this is an unrestricted monopoly. Um, the, uh, the rules that have been established by the Department of Fisheries and Oceans for clear water was that they did not have a season. So the season only applied to, uh, to the inshore. The offshore had no limit on, uh, on season. And really, there's uh, there's not much of a limit on what on the catch that uh, that uh, that clear water could take. Um, so, and they're the only ones offering, the only big corporation that was operating in that area. They literally had, um, they literally had uh, a complete and total monopoly um, on those fishes. And the, the red areas here indicate uh, the Clearwater lobster catch. So they were working right along the borders of both the, uh, both the inshores and then a little bit um, in the, uh, yeah, that's clearly in in LFA 41. Okay, so that's the that's the geography of it. So what has happened is that uh, on September 17th, uh, the uh, the Mi'kmaq communities, uh, particularly um, uh, from Shuby, um, uh, announced that they were going to launch uh, their own their own fishery uh, based on the treaty rights that they had negotiated with the Crown, 1760 to 61. And in fact, I'll just say that. I think there's a, there's a, a clear uh, clear argument um, to be made that um, that with or without those uh, those treaties, it's an inherent right for Mi'kmaq people, which they have never surrendered, anyways. But the I guess the importance uh, in terms of relationship with Canada is that there was actually a negotiated agreement on on this way back in the 18th century, which has never really been um, acknowledged or uh, actually was not acknowledged. Uh, so, so, um, so this is part of that, uh, part of that, uh, that conflict. In any event, uh, September 17th saw the launch of the, uh, of the fishery and that day and in the weeks afterwards, uh, was an escalating confrontation, um, basically triggered by what I would describe as acts of vigilantism by, uh, by commercial fishers. Uh, who were operating in LFA 34, um, and they were furious at what they saw as uh, as Mi'kmaq fishing out of season, and uh, accused them of uh, threatening the um, the viability of the stock. So. Um, so they engaged in numerous acts of uh, of intimidation um, and aggression. 
including um, putting their own boats in the water. At one point, there were nearly 100, um, 100 uh, commercial fishers who were literally blockading the Mi'kmaq fishers within uh, Margaret's Bay. Uh, and it escalated from there to the point where there were shots being fired at Mi'kmaq fishers, as well as flare guns being shot at them. Um, there were uh, attacks on the traps that were laid, so they cut the lines uh, and uh, and two boats were burned um, uh, uh, in harbor. So uh, then uh, came uh, October 13th and October 17th. Uh, October 13th uh, was uh, was an attack, a mass attack by uh, where the lobster were being stored in in one of the communities in Digby County, which was Middle West Pubnico, um, about two hundred uh, about two hundred showed up um, and locked in the uh, the uh, people who were Mi'kmaq who were inside the pound threatened them uh, with their lives. <clears throat> uh, they burned a uh, a van that night. Um, and uh, and uh, destroyed the catch. They dumped it all out. Uh, four days later, um, that uh, that lobster pound was burned to the ground. Um, and uh, on October thirteenth, the original day. Also, by the way, the first incident was at another lobster pound in New Edinburgh, um, where uh, where the uh, lobster pound also was ransacked by uh, what I could only describe as a vigilante mob. So, uh, so things got uh, got out of hand um, uh, quite quickly, and one of the uh, most egregious aspects of that was the unwillingness of the RCMP to intervene in any way. And in fact, I'll go further and say that, I, uh, in my view, they're implicated in uh, in facilitating the attacks on at least uh, well the two, uh, not the arson, <laughs> but the uh, but the uh, but the mobbing of the uh, of the two lobster pounds. There were RC there was an RCMP presence there. And they did nothing um, to uh, to attempt to de-escalate the situation. So there's been a constant criticism about the RCMP uh, involvement. It really appears as if they um, they were actively engaged in attempting to um, to undermine the fishery and uh, and encouraging or at least facilitating the actions of the uh, of the commercial fishers. Uh, so. So this uh, this uh, was the uh, was the situation. Um, I will say also there have been some arrests since then. The uh, there was considerable amount of criticism uh, made about the uh, the way the RCMP was handling it. Um, so they've made twenty one arrests as of uh, December eleventh. We'll see uh, we'll see where that goes. They for sure have not <laughs> they have not um, tracked down everybody who has been uh, has been involved in uh, that illegal activity. Also, there was an there was an attack on Chief Sack, who was uh, who was assaulted on October fourteenth. He's the uh, he's the chief at uh, at Shuby. So. Uh, anyways, the uh, the <laughs> the the other side of this too has been the. Um, it, it's interesting to note the role of both provincial and federal governments in uh, in all of this. Um, at least uh, two uh, individuals who who are associated with the NDP. Um, one was uh, Sterling Bellavo, who was uh, during the Dexter government in 20, 2009 to 2013, uh, Sterling Bellavo was the um, was the NDP minister for the fisheries and the environment. In any event, he's also a commercial fisherman and he was up to his elbows in, uh, in stoking uh, the vigilantism. Um, most recently, Sterling Bellavo has announced his intention to seek nomination for the Tories um, in, uh, in Shelburne, which is around that area. So, uh, the other, uh, the other person um, connected with the NDP is a guy by the name of Colin Spruill, who um, represents the uh, the Fishermen's Association in um, in uh, oh, it's not the uh, it's the Bay of Fundy um, Inshore Fishermen's Association. Anyways, he's been actively supporting the um, uh, the uh, the commercial fisher vigilantism um, towards the Mi'kmaq fishery. So, so um, 
In terms of the provincial government, uh, uh, they've really been engaged in uh, in a game of uh, pin the blame on the federal government, um, expressing concern about the violence, but doing absolutely nothing to um, to uh, to defend the uh, the, uh, the treaty rights of the Mi'kmaq fishers. Uh, and that's not a new uh, new thing for the Liberal government here. Um, they got themselves into some hot water uh, a few years ago, uh, and it's still an ongoing um, uh, court case, I believe, where the, uh, the Premier here in Nova Scotia described the Mi'kmaq people as a conquered people, <laughs> and they are not. They have never been conquered. Um, and... Uh, in any event, but that is that sums up the attitude really of the provincial government, as far as I can see, which is that they see them as conquered and therefore the treaty rights don't apply. And this is really what's going on. Um, the Department of Fisheries and Oceans has also been um, been actively, uh, the officers in particular, um, have been actively engaged in supporting the vigilantism. Uh, in the case of the uh, uh, Budalakek, um, which is First Nation on uh, on Cape Breton Island, uh, the DFO has been playing the role of actively seizing all of the lobster traps that they put down. So it's not just the uh, the commercial fishermen; it's also uh, government um, enforcement that are seizing um, seizing the uh, the uh, lobster traps and trying to shut down the fishery. And in the meantime, they're just playing the game of football, um, talking about well, we need to. We need to negotiate the terms of what it means to have a moderate livelihood. Um, and so this is the line coming from DFO, from the minister, from the provincial government, from the commercial fishermen. And the reality of it is there's no negotiations to be had. Those negotiations happened in 1760 and 1761. The issue is settled. Mi'kmaq people are sovereign and they, they, have, um, they have the right to access the resources on their land and on their waters. And uh, so what I see happening is just a flat out refusal. To uh, to acknowledge that uh, that sovereignty and to try and rope them um, into the framework set by the government and uh, the only thing that's really going to solve this is eventually um, coming to terms and respecting the treaties that were negotiated with the Mi'kmaq. There's since then has been uh, one other really fascinating um, development and that was the uh, the purchase of Clearwater um, by six or seven Mi'kmaq communities. <laughs> so uh, this was, um, I don't know I really um, how, to, uh, how to describe this, but, um, but essentially now <laughs> Mi'kmaq control the offshore fishery. <laughs> um, so it'll be interesting to uh, to see how that plays out. Uh, so how that one has come, I won't go through the history of it, but I will say that um, that there were uh, there were I think six communities, six Mi'kmaq communities in Nova Scotia, um, and one Mi'kmaq community in Newfoundland and Labrador that uh, banded together to um, to make the purchase, and they hold fifty percent of uh, of the shares now. In um, in Clearwater, and the other uh, fifty percent is held by uh, by a, a company. I don't know anything about them. Uh, I intended to look it up before this, but I didn't have the chance. But they're in BC, so maybe you folks out there could have a look at them. But it's called BC Premium Brands Holding. Uh, so they partnered with the uh, with the six seven Mi'kmaq communities here out on the east coast, and they um, there's seven Mi'kmaq communities hold 50% and BC Premium Brands holds the other 50%. Um, this is the single largest Indigenous investment in Canadian history or the history of, uh, uh, of Canada um, uh, in, sea, in the seafood industry. So and just so you know, I mean, Clearwater doesn't do just the lobster, but uh, they're also uh, a global leader uh, in shrimp, snow crabs, scallop, um, clams, as well as offshore lobster. So they're just a major player. Their 2019 sales uh, were $616 million. So uh, anyways, um, it's an interesting turn of events um, because now they control all of the, they control all of the, the offshore licenses too. And it's, it's quite considerable. Um, uh, so yeah, the number of traps I could go over, but maybe we can, uh, we could, uh, we could 
uh, we, some of that will come out in the course of the discussion. Um, anyways, so that's all I'm going to say for now. Um, the struggle is ongoing, uh, but it really looks to me like uh, the Mi'kmaq communities have managed to capture the momentum actually and have moved it forward. But it's been um, it's been uh, it's been a really difficult struggle. My part in it um, was to do what I could to to organize uh, community support uh, and to bring settlers around to um, to e expressly um, supporting uh, Mi'kmaq rights. So we did that, and we raised money here in Antigonish, and we rallied. Um, so. And there was, I think, a pretty surprisingly strong response from, from settlers. I mean, a lot of media attention on the uh, antagonisms coming from the commercial fishers, but uh, lots of other places, um, settlers were, uh, were pretty clearly expressing their support for, uh, for, the, for Mi'kmaq rights. Um, some good rallies in Halifax and so on. And there was a bit of a boycott that was starting to take shape of, um, of the commercial catch uh, in favor of the Mi'kmaq catch. So. Uh, so there were some interesting uh, political uh, developments in that respect as well. Anyways, I'm going to just park it there and see uh, see where we want to go. And I don't know if Alex or J Jim has any uh, anything to add. So. Okay. Um, yeah, I have Thanks, uh, I have one thing that I wanted to add to that. Um, I wasn't I, I didn't read too much about it. But I, I watched uh, Sockage Ward speak about it at the Vancouver Art Gallery during a rally. And I was, I was seeing a lot of community feedback about the discussion about the Mi'kma and all the stuff going on. Um, I did a little bit of reading about it last night. And there was, there was two, two um, cases. There was one where the member Tau First Nation, they were buying two of the licenses for 25 million a piece. I mean, maybe 25 million is a pair. Yeah, and I think the so. articles, the article said that it's a really lucrative deal for both sides. And there are two critiques I have of that statement. And the first is that it's indigenous people. They're paying a corporation 25 million to fish resources that ultimately belong to them. The second is something that I heard from the community. And the discussion was that the lobster industry and the biomass, it's dying. And the discussion was centered around the billion dollar deal with Clearwater. Yeah. It sounded like really like the most amazing thing ever, but from what the community was saying, it's, it kind of sounds like the Clearwater is getting a bailout and the stockholders are getting a bailout. It sounds like they're exiting now that the biomass is depleting and the industry is kind of in its... Uh, not its death throes, but it's, it's on its decline. So in, in terms of finance and prosperity for those folks, it doesn't sound like it's as big as a victory as it was made to sound, but that's only in terms of thinking about dollars and capital. It's still a huge win for indigenous people because they can maintain sustainability. They can make sure that clear water doesn't drive it to extinction that i guarantee that the atlantic lobster would have been driven right down to nothing it would have been milked for every last drop that it was worth until it was gone if that corporation held full control that's thoughts that's, on that chris yeah go ahead yeah, I, do. I know I, I jim's right um this is this is the argument uh, that I hear. This is the response I consistently hear from uh, from Mi'kmaq communities, which is that the uh, that if there are any problems with sustainability, um, uh, not just the lobsters but the biomass in general, because there's there are problems, real serious problems uh, that are, are now and further on down the road. But um, but the uh, indigenous approach to um, to the use of land and the waters is sustainable and. That if, that if there's a problem, it is precisely with the commercial fishers, and especially with Clearwater. Um, there, the uh, environmentalists, uh, the environmental whatever uh, federal 
authorities uh, keep saying that uh, that the uh, that the that the lobster numbers are healthy and that they're growing, um, which. I don't know. I'm not expert enough to be able to comment on that, uh, like as an expert, but it, it surprises me because all of the other data I hear is that, um, is that there's beginnings of mass die off in the, in the oceans, um, for all kinds of reasons, not the least of which is the, uh, is that the temperature of the waters is changing and it's going to affect uh, various species who are off our shores. And so, uh, so there are some, what looks like some irrevocable changes that are starting to happen unless we can find a way to get climate change under control and also to deal with the, um, with the uh, abuse of extraction of resources from the, from the ocean, which characterizes the commercial industry. So in that respect, uh, Jim's completely right about uh, about uh, about the significance of the purchase there, the scale of it. <laughs> well, it's huge, and and maybe <laughs> maybe this is just the corporate thing um, with the newspapers is to make a big deal out of all of that. Uh, but yeah, it's a, it's very much an issue of uh, of a sustainable uh, a sustainable industry. I should mention that um, that Clearwater is probably uh, yeah. I think they've got some concerns about declining stock on the, in the long run. Uh, there's also been uh, uh, Clearwater has also gotten itself in some uh, in. Uh, has come under criticism because of their uh, uh, various practices. For example, uh, they tended to store the gear on the ocean floor in their fishing area. Um, in 2017, they left uh, 3,800 traps on the floor for uh, for I think it was uh, it was two months, um, and they brought up about 15,000 pounds of dead lobster and other fish. Um, <laughs> so, um, and then uh, they were warned about this practice by DFO and uh, they didn't listen. And then finally they were, um, they, were, uh, they were charged and fined, but then got not even, they didn't even get a slap on the wrist. It was like a slap on the little finger, actually a slap on the tip of the little finger um, because it was a $30,000 fine. <laughs> what kind of a deterrence is that? And then th this is one of the remarkable things about it too, is that the response of DFO with respect to Clearwater as a corporation, like doing nothing and bending over backwards to try and, and, uh, and talk to Clearwater and convince them to be better corporate citizens. Um, and then when they don't, they get this tiny, tiny little punishment in the meantime. Uh, the treatment of Mi'kmaq fishers, for example, on Cape Breton Island, and the seizure of traps by DFO, and the refusal um, by DFO to um, to do anything around Solnayville. So there's been clearly a double standard, and so the purchase of Clearwater uh, may have the benefit of pushing out uh, the previous owners, who I think were abusive in their approach to, uh, to the lobster fishing there, um, may make it more possible to uh, introduce sustainable practices in the offshore fishing. And if they win, uh, they, I'm sure they will actually win the, the struggle for over uh, access to the inshore fishing. Um, so that may be the hope for uh, uh, partial hope for the uh, for the lobster industry, but there's a larger context that also has to be uh, considered, which is what's happening in the oceans as a whole. So, so that's kind of what pops into my head um, based on what you've said, Jim. There was uh, one more interesting thing about it, and the the clear water they had ninety nine point nine one percent of the quota yeah like it's like the amount of quota that they didn't have was small enough to be a, a statistical glitch and because they had so much quota they had to they really had to redirect any frustration that the workers had that the white yeah. fishermen had and they did it extremely successfully and the same thing has happened on the coast here yeah where the license holders and Clearwater, they're able to direct all the frustration towards Indigenous people, whereas Indigenous people aren't the ones making billions of dollars. They're not the ones at home collecting the wealth of the labor of these other fishermen. And it's been done so well where there's not an ounce of class solidarity, 
there's not an ounce of concern for the resources being destroyed, being eradicated. If the, um, I would bet anything that it Clearwater has spent a few million. Oh yeah, directly psychologically subjugating and turning its employees and its workers against the native folks because all of those fishermen in Nova Scotia, they should be furious with Clearwater. They're a monopoly. They take all the wealth. They yeah. own everything. They run an autocracy of the resources there. But the fishermen never said anything about that. And the only frustration they had was directed at the indigenous folks. Yeah. And I remember specifically they had, Clearwater had 300,000 traps in that, uh, in that big offshore area. That's right. And then in the little area, the, the close one, the native folks had 250 traps. Total. Yeah. Total. Oh my goodness. Yeah, the, 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 <laughs> there's no, not even any, there's no comparison whatsoever. Um, the, uh, the quota, um, by the way, for, um, for clear water was 720 tons. Yeah. It's huge, enormous, right? And yeah. <laughs> so if there's any danger to, uh, danger to the depletion of the lobster stock, that's where it's coming from. Um, yeah. So, and, and what, one of the reasons the Clearwater thing surprised me is that uh, is that it must have been like this. These negotiations were happening for a while. This is not new. So, so it seems to me that those negotiations were probably going on in September when the uh, when the Mi'kmaq fishery was launched. And you know, there were moments when the owner of Clearwater, a uh, guy by the name of John Risley. Um, uh, he was on the uh, he was on the uh, on the wharf at Saulnierville, <laughs> egging on the vigilantes, you know, uh, in, at the same time as he's negotiating with, with <laughs> Mi'kmaq communities. It's just the most bizarre um, sort of surreal kind of uh, image in my own head. Uh, yeah, and they also were working hand in hand with uh, with uh, another. Uh, uh, a, a distributor called uh, oh what were they what was their name um, Atlantic Canada Atlantic Canada Seafood uh, yeah um, so they uh, they were really prominent they were sort of um, they were saying all the things in public uh, that uh, that Clearwater wasn't um, and they were agitating against the Mi'kmaq every day multiple posts on their Facebook page uh, accusing the Mi'kmaq of engaging in poaching, um, if you can believe that. Um, and, and also um, uh, really distorting uh, what the uh, Indigenous relationship is to the, uh, to the, uh, to the Canadian government too. Um, you'd see things like statements from the, uh, like there's a group called the Atlantic Canada Fishermen's Association, um, which is really the association for the uh, for the uh, for the salmon farming that's happening out here. That's all they do support that. But they're also connected to Atlantic Canada seafood. So you hear them saying shit like, uh, "Oops, I don't know if I can say words like that." Sorry. Uh, there are nearly <laughs> nearly thirty federal departments. They say and agencies that give money to Aboriginal Canadians. Take you know and and making it's this oh, tired old argument about uh, about the easy money that the Canadian government throws at Indigenous people and what they're trying to create is this, this idea of the the hard-pressed commercial fishermen uh, having their livelihoods threatened by uh, by Indigenous poachers but it's really a grotesque grotesque characterization of the reality on the ground there. Yeah Chris uh... It's uh, it's very interesting the sort of parallels there are in the ideological debates over these issues between uh, the East Coast and the West Coast. Uh, here, of course, uh, most of British Columbia was, uh, uh, there were never treaties over most of the territory of, of this part of the world. Uh, the you know historic argument of the the colonizers was that uh, the land here was simply uh, taken uh, and that uh, there were no rights 
left for the First Nations peoples, and it took decades of uh, court struggles, legal battles, uh, political struggles uh, of, of all different kinds uh, in order to, uh, to get some of these fundamental rights recognized. Uh, and it's similar in other parts of the country, of course, where I'm from on the prairies, the, yeah. the numbered treaties there uh, uh, never specified that the land was being taken from the original peoples. The treaty said that the land was going to be shared to the depth of the tip of a plow between the settlers and the indigenous peoples. Well, that, uh, uh, that was sort of regarded as a technicality best left to be ignored by history uh, yeah. while the resource extraction uh, began to, to really move forward uh, on a completely unimpeded basis. But you know, here on, in the coast, maybe Jim, uh, it'd be interesting to hear you say something about these struggles by First Nations out here uh, you know, the background of this, uh, the whole debate over uh, fishing rights, we often hear it placed in terms here of, uh, well, there's the, uh, the rights of the companies, there's the rights of the sport fishing sector, there's the rights of indigenous peoples, these all have to be balanced, uh, and so forth. It's never put in terms of uh, the only fundamental right is the right of the original inhabitants here uh, to carry on with their uh, time immemorial uh, way of living uh, to defend their cultures, their histories, their peoples. Uh, uh, everything else is, is secondary to that. Jim, could you just uh, uh, tell us something about that from, from your perspective? Oh yeah, there's, there's lots of information there. Um, so a while ago, I mentioned the prices of the licenses going up and up and up. And that continued to happen for a long time where lots of the original fishermen, they got priced out, lots of them got old, and then there was less and less money in it. So it's been increasingly a way for, uh, it used to be so prosperous and now it's like just a way to get by. There's so many fishermen who go broke, who rely on their wives to send the money to get home, going into debt, uh, owing money, owing money to tons of different folks, having gear that you're making payments on, loans. There's so much of a lack of prosperity. And that prosperity has gone straight to the license holders. It's gone straight to uh, the corporations who have been able to buy. And uh, I don't like the word invest, but they've been able to buy these pieces of paper that allows them to extract wealth from the actual fishermen doing the work. And with the licenses on the West Coast, most of the license holders, they don't do any of the work. And most of them, they live in a little town called Annaville Slough. And they've been there for a long time, just getting rich off of fishermen's labor and indigenous resources. Um, one other big problem is that Jimmy Pattison and other corporations, they own Savon and the distribution centers. And because of that, they're able to set the final price and they can adjust that as they see fit and lower it and raise it and price gouge and do whatever they want. But because they're the ones at the end of the tunnel, they get to determine what fishermen will be paid along the way. Um, one thing about the uh, herring industry is back in the day, you could get $5,000 a ton. And that was done by lots of families. Uh, my employer did that and he made $4,000 in a week. And that was, it was, that was the only week they had, but it was an extremely lucrative week. And it was, wasn't the most dangerous work. So it was really good for a lot of families. Um, th there's, a, there's been a bunch of big decisions, but I'll speak about the uh, Sparrow case. And I have this, I copy pasted a thing just to read on because I don't know everything about the Sparrow decision. But uh, it says the Sparrow case is largely considered a significant victory for Indigenous rights in Canada. The ruling provided a code 
for interpretation of Section 35 of the Constitution Act of 1982. And it confirmed the Crown's constitutional duty to provide certain guarantees to Indigenous people. And it said, you see the law of fiduciary obligation. However, some critics argue that while the Sparrow ruling upholds Indigenous rights, it also confirms that the government can legally justify infringing on those rights. Future cases on Indigenous rights, including the Haida Nation versus British Columbia in 2004, and the Taku River Tlingit First Nation versus British Columbia in 2004, further explore issues unresolved by the Sparrow case, namely consultation and compensation regarding the infringement of Indigenous rights. Um, there's some more cases. Oh, but the, what, what caused that uh, big court case? It was in 1990. And there was a guy, gentleman named Ronald Edgar Sparrow from Musqueam. And he was caught using a net that was permitted outside of the regulations that we were permitted to use for food fishing. And fisheries came and they took his stuff. And he said, this is my right. We've been doing this since time immemorial. Who are you to justify what, the way I'm able to fish our traditional foods? And that was um, argued and then it was appealed once and then there was another appeal and then neither Ronald Edgar Sparrow and the fisheries, neither of them were satisfied. So it was driven to the, the Supreme Court where all the biggest decisions were made and it's really, it's really an intense thing because it's so expensive to go to the Supreme Court. Most, the vast majority of people don't have the finances required to take cases that far. So every, all the, all the, the status quo, it favors those with the money to do that. But most fishermen, not, not a chance. Um, Recently, there was, uh, oh, I'll speak about the new Chalith. Uh, they had their big court case in 2009. And that was a huge one. That's on the top of Vancouver Island. And they won the rights to half of all the fish coming out of the area. The only thing they weren't allowed to fish is gooey duck. And the gooey duck licenses go for $5 million. So what I see is that the government is taking action to ensure that gooey duck holders, or goo gooey duck license holders get to maintain their monopoly of wealth extraction and directly prevent the new challenges from getting in on any of that action. Uh, we have a, a question uh, in the, the chat here. Somebody is asking about the, our views on the fish farms. Uh, I'll just say a, a couple words about that and then I'll turn it over to, to Jim. Uh, I remember my partner and I actually were taken on a tour of uh, one of the early fish farms back in the, the 70s. One of her relatives uh, had one out of Port Alberni. We took a, a boat up the river there and, and got to look at this. Uh, those folks, later got out of the fish farming. Uh, uh, they could see that it was not a sustainable industry, that this was going to be uh, uh, environmentally problematic and, and so forth. They sold the, uh, the venture to one of the, the big Norwegian uh, agriculture uh, companies and made some money out of it. Uh, the uh, Those who argue that closing down fish farms is unexpected. Uh, certainly haven't been following what's happening. Uh, uh, Alexandra Morton's work, for example, the, uh, uh, the scientist who's been monitoring the effect of fish farms on the wild salmon runs has uh, provided mountains of evidence over the years that the, uh, the lice from the, uh, the ocean-based fish farms uh, are killing off wild salmon stocks. Uh, so this is certainly not a, a surprise to anyone. Uh, this is why some people were calling for a, a ban on these uh, ocean-based fish farms from the beginning and uh, only allowing 
on land uh, salmon fishing pens. Uh, but Jim, can you tell us uh, uh, what your thoughts are on on this this type of uh, uh, industry, the uh, the fish farms? Yeah, there's that, that that ties into a later sub a later topic I wanted to touch on, so that works out perfectly. Um, fish farms they they pay pretty good to workers. There's there's native workers there, there's non-native workers there, and they're paid pretty well. Lots of them are paid thirty dollars an hour, and it's not wildly dangerous work. It's incredibly steady work, considering it's involved in the fishing industry. The fishing industry has been increasingly precarious for decades um i but i totally understand why these need to be phased out and they need to be moved on to land the these there's hundreds of thousands of fish hundreds of thousands of these farmed salmon and they're swimming in their own shit and that's where they fester and they live there and they don't swim tons. They don't have any fat. They don't have proper muscle. They're, they don't eat well. And they breed disease. And tons and tons of the wild salmon, they get infected because the sea lice, they, they don't just stay there. They move around. <clears throat> they get taken by the tide. They latch onto other fish. And they breed. And they just cause un tons of disease. But the, <clears throat> th there's ways to do it right. Um, I was watching this one video a while ago and it was showing how they do it in the Philippines. And they have these big pools and they have trees that have their roots in it. And the re the, it serves to clean the oxygen. And it, in turn, it, it fuels the growth of the trees in it. It's such a, it's so much healthier and better for sustainability. There's no need for us to introduce uh, disease to the wild salmon populace. The wild salmon populace has been struggling for a long time. Um, one of the big problems with, uh, in the last couple decades was the heating of the oceans and kind of sounds like it would just be a general problem but it's actually a really specific problem to the salmon industry where usually they go through the Johnson Strait, uh, Johnston Strait which is between Vancouver Island and the mainland but because it's been heating up for so many of the runs they've gone around Vancouver Island so all the fishermen who specifically leased licenses to fish in Johnston Strait which has historically been a fantastic place for fishing salmon. All those people have zero fish. The, it goes all the way around the island and the people don't fish over there. The, the license is specifically for Johnson Strait. So the only people who get to see fish are the people at the NAS, when the first, where they first come from, and at the end in Musqueam and the Squamish Nation. So it just leaves out so many fishermen. Uh, the other thing that ties into was um, a lot of the herring industry has been butchered and that has been specifically butchered in a way that enriches um, corporations and people who own sane boats and who own the licenses. I found out about it last year. My coworker was teasing me. And the way the sane, the sanes work is they fish a ridiculous volume and it kills them all. But the way that our traditional harvest is, is that we, we set lines and then we tie a few hundred things called beckets. And then we go underneath the water, freezing our hands all day to pull out and harvest uh, long, long um, pieces of seaweed and we have all these different pieces of seaweed and then we tie it to the lines, a few hundred of them. And then we plant that and we plant it along the beach or we plant it where, wherever we think this uh, herring are gonna spawn. So we do that in order to just to catch the eggs because 
the eggs are all over the beach. There, there'll be a half inch thick coating of eggs along the entire beach, just thousands and thousands of tons. And the way that harvest works is we don't kill the fish. Those fish can fish, uh, they can spawn six or seven years. And we get like $20 a pound for those eggs. Whereas with the seine fishery, they get like 11 cents a pound. I don't know if it's more sometimes, but the number I've heard was 11 cents a pound. And that happens largely because that, um, that biomass gets turned into fish for the fish farms. So you have the seine boats prospering massively, the biomass getting destroyed, and the fish farms that are incredibly happy with the steel. And the steel largely goes through because it's to make Norway happy. And that goes through because in Quebec, there's a great deal of dairy that's sold to Norway. So a lot of, there's a whole bunch of different variables and things that are actually implicated in fish farms. But I'll be, I'll be really happy the day that we can see them moved on to land and see them done in a healthy way that um, doesn't put any other populations at risk. Thank you. Yeah, it, it certainly seems uh, as though the whole process of capitalist development uh, uh, puts the interests of, uh, of the salmon runs at the, the bottom, uh, along with the interests of indigenous people. You look at some of the threats to uh, the salmon fishery here on the West Coast. We remember the, the Mount Polly uh, tailings pond disaster, which put millions and millions of, of tons of uh, effluent uh, into salmon spawning streams and rivers. We see the, the increasing temperature, uh, the rivers and streams as a result of global warming. Uh, and this is a, a direct threat to uh, the salmon runs uh, uh, all across the province. And of course, global warming is uh, uh, you know the product of uh, rising carbon emissions we see uh, here in British Columbia, we have a government uh, which claims to be pro-environmental, uh, and yet they give big tax breaks to uh, the, the LNG industry. Uh, this is a government that's going ahead with pouring tens of uh, well, billions of dollars into building the Site C dam uh, for the express purpose of providing electricity for the LNG industry. So all of these things come together to uh, uh, to make it, uh, you know, a, a serious threat to the survival of uh, the fisheries here in the West Coast, you know, all for the sake of private profits of the resource extraction sector, as far as anybody here can see. Um, Chris, did you have anything to add on, on this particular question about the fish farms? Yeah, they're, they're <laughs> undergoing a massive expansion out here, too. Um, oh, no. Oh yeah, um, I can, I can, there's a, just a long list of, of existing and then proposed sites. So they're, they're attempting to expand the fishery, um, uh, fish, salmon fish farms, and it's all the same problem. It's open, it's open um, sea fish farms, right? They fence it in, but that's it. Uh, so all of the same problems of, uh, of disease, infection, um, fish lice, um, the feces, and, and also use of pesticides. Um, uh, so it's all leaching into the uh, into the ocean, and it's affecting uh, sea, um, wild sea life. You know, so and it poses a threat to the existing uh, wild salmon stock too, because they get infected with the sea lice. Uh, so yeah, so it's a big problem um, here, and I don't see uh, I don't see it changing much real soon. I'm intrigued by um, the idea of uh, moving them um, on land. Um, I'd be really interested in seeing how that would work. Um, uh, there was one other thing I wanted to mention about. Oh yeah, um, the, <laughs> interestingly enough, uh, some of the proposed um, uh, salmon farms are also located around where the uh, are in the lobster fishing areas. And there's so this actually uh, may be a threat to the viability of the um, of the of the lobster stock. 
By the way, is the, is the introduction of, uh, of the salmon farms. So, so it's another aspect of the commercial, uh, commercial uh, fishery. Um, and in, you know, it shows the, the problems, the lack of concern with, uh, with sustainability or with the health of the, the stock. So we have the same problem. Yeah, this uh, uh, came up during our last provincial convention here, the Communist Party. We were uh, looking at uh, uh, what would a, uh, a viable fishing industry look like under a socialist uh, system here in British Columbia, uh, trying to update our policies in this regard. Uh, certainly, it, it clashes with the whole idea of the, the resource extraction model of, of capitalism. It's how can you have uh, you know, a sustainable environment in this province if everything is oriented towards uh, creating a fairly small number of jobs uh, yeah. to simply ship out raw materials from, from this province uh, to heat up the planet. It, none of it makes any sense in, in the big picture. Uh, if we did have a, a socialist society here, uh, one would think that you know, models like the, uh, uh, you know, the on-land salmon fishery pens, uh, such as Jim was talking about uh, uh, in the Philippines, these things could be studied seriously and provide for you know, the long range uh, future of the communities involved uh, without destroying other parts of the economy. But of course, that's, that's not the way things are at the moment. If people have other questions, uh, you can put them up and our technical support folks will forward them to, uh, to Jim and Chris. Uh, we can deal with them here. Uh, don't know if there's any other questions right at the moment, but if either of you wants to uh, uh, to look at other angles of what we've been talking about, uh, go ahead. Well, one thing, one thing that, uh, that I'm thinking about a lot is, uh, is about how to, how to build solidarity um, and also to raise consciousness, especially in, in settler communities about what the, what the reality of some of these issues are. Uh, and so the uh, the conflict in um, in Digby here has been uh, particularly difficult to witness, um, but it's not the only model that I've seen. If you want to talk about models per se, and I, I think a lot about um, uh, about the events surrounding the um, the struggle to close um, Northern Pulp um, in Picto Picto. Um, Victor Landing First Nation and the destruction of their community by that particular industry. Uh, the plan had there had been to um, to dump the effluents, uh, pipe it into um, into the ocean, into uh, <laughs> into the strait, and this was a direct threat to the commercial fishery there. So in this instance, however, uh, the um, the conflict uh, we saw the unity uh, develop a united campaign between commercial fishers in in Picto, okay, and Picto um, Landing First Nations. They both had a common interest. They found a common interest in dealing with the um, with the pulp mill. Um, the only uh, the only outlier there was the response by the union in um, in the mill itself, which was Unifor, and they campaigned hard to try and keep the mill open. But keeping the mill open um, would have constituted a threat to um, to the health and the um, the sovereignty of Picto Landing First Nation and also uh, Picto uh, Town itself and uh, and the fishing industry um, in the Straits there. Um, that one, I think I'm convinced could have been uh, resolved had either the provincial or the federal governments made moves to, uh, to transition those workers out of the mill because that was really their concern was losing good paying jobs with benefits and pensions. And I understand that, um, but the answer absolutely was not to keep the mill open. Uh, but they use those workers um, as a spearhead against uh, against the indigenous community as well as the commercial fishers. So there was a clear attempt to you know to pit um, two two or three groups of working people against each other by the corporation and also by the provincial government. 
But the outcome of that was largely determined by the strength of the unity between Picto landing um, First Nations and also the commercial fishers in, in Picto. Um, so that's an example where, uh, where there was an opportunity to build a relationship that could produce a result in a common struggle that was to the benefit of both groups. So, uh, so I, you know, to me that is, uh, is a hopeful development and shows a way forward for resolving some of these other issues. And it, I think, also shows that um, if you take the right approach and engage in the right kind of conversations with people, that it's possible to build those kinds of alliances. So I think that's where, that's where um, things should move towards. So, and it could be an approach for uh, for the struggles around our fishery here too. Yeah, there has to be a, a conscious attempt to find common interests. I mean, we saw that back historically in the you know, periods of time when the, the UFAW, the Fishermen's Union and the Native Brotherhood were able to cooperate in struggles for uh, better prices uh, you know, against the uh, the big fish packing companies, it was not uh, not an easy process. Uh, it helped that the the UFAW was led by people like Homer Stevens, uh, yeah. whose grandmother was uh, uh, Cowich and First Nation. Homer uh, and the other people in the Fishermen's Union leadership here uh, really consciously understood the need for. Uh, unity between Indigenous and non-Indigenous workers, uh, but if you don't work at that, it's not going to come accidentally or simply by chance. Uh, you know, in, in that case, uh, you know, it was, uh, uh, it was a positive factor that if you looked at the, uh, uh, the shore workers, they were, you know, a mix of Indigenous and, and non-Indigenous, they had very direct common interests. They were able to, to build unity there. Uh, but you also had incidents in British Columbia history where, where other things happen. Just a, a mile from where I'm sitting right now is the Pacific National Exhibition where the, the, uh, the confiscated boats of the Japanese uh, fishers were sold off uh, for pennies on the dollar after the Japanese were interned at the beginning of, uh, uh, well, after the attack on Pearl Harbor during the Second World War. Uh, there were you know, commercial interests in the fishing industry that took advantage and jumped right in and bought those boats for almost nothing. Uh, uh, it was part of the, you know, the, uh, the history of the uh, uh, encouragement of racism that divided working people and in this province, a very shameful episode. You can't uh, you can't drive by the PE out here without uh, uh, remembering the photographs of all of those uh, hundreds of boats lined up for sale, auctioned off, uh, right where today people you know ride the Ferris wheel and eat their hot dogs and and have a good time. Uh, so. Um, Jim, you got uh, more to add about some of the stuff that you've been talking about today? Yeah, um, the, I read one really interesting thing. Uh, my primary employer actually mentioned it to me. And during the Sparrow decision, I think it was 19, 1990, if I'm not mistaken, but the, there's a Supreme Court Justice, Beverly McLaughlin, and she said it's her opinion that First Nations people have the right to a moderate livelihood. And since then, we've heard that time used over and over again, moderate livelihood, where we should be able to harvest and sell our fish. We, like, you can eat fish all you want, but if you can't pay your hydro bill, if you can't pay your gas bill, if you can't pay your diesel bill, there's, there's no hope. Yeah. So being able to fish food isn't enough. We should be able to um, fish for a moderate livelihood and get by. We didn't need uh, all the stuff we need. We needed before a thousand years ago. We didn't need a license. We didn't need uh, to fiberglass our boats. We didn't need all kinds of sinks and maintenance and paint jobs every year, lifting the boat. We didn't need all that stuff, but 
there's so many things today that we can't really get by without. And that was, I was really happy to see that, see that she said that. There was one more here. Oh yeah. Uh, and uh, the article that I was reading about her said that she grew up in rural Alberta and that that was actually one of the factors that contributed to her really promoting consensus among the judges on the Supreme Court. And this really helped with the issues of uh, euthanasia, uh, sex work and indigenous land claims. Before being on the Supreme Court, she was a professor at UBC and she had a really intense public battle with that devil, Stephen Harper. <laughs> Uh, just when you think you never have to hear the name Stephen Harper again, somebody brings it up. <laughs> <laughs> now we have the, the prime minister with the Haida tattoo. Uh, uh, <laughs> uh, that's such an improvement. Yes. I have a question for you, Jim. Yeah. So uh, about, this is about the, the term uh, moderate uh, livelihood. Did you say that was a part of the decision, the Sparrow decision? Um. I don't, I don't know, but afterwards okay. she came out or at some point she came out and said that she believes that we should have the right to a moderate livelihood right. instead of just, instead of just food fishing. Okay. I just was wondering, cause I mean, that's the same thing out here too. Right. And, and it's, everything seems to be revolving around this phrase. It, it seems curious to me and I'm just trying to sort this out in my mind because what they, what even is the moderate life? What does that mean? Um, and I don't know why you shouldn't just have the right to fish, period. Um, and it just seems like it's setting, it, uh, setting up an argument, which is going to well, get in the way. Yeah, it's, it's really funny. It's like, how do you draw the line it, as, as what's a moderate livelihood? Is, is a moderate livelihood 80000 a year? Is it 20000 mm -hmm. a year? Is it yeah. $1 above the line of poverty? <laughs> Yeah, I like, know. This really? But I wonder, like, is this just a way of, of trying to keep indigenous fisher uh, people like um, from from being, I don't know, well off? I don't, and I don't mean rich, but I just mean like having a comfortable, comfortable existence. Um, yeah. And so yeah, where do you set, where do you set that bar? Yeah, that was uh, one thing I wanted to bring up too, with with my nation, we're we're permitted to food fish and sell our food fish, but only up to 4% of the total mass that's taken out of the area. Mm -hmm. So with this, with this framework, corporations and license holders control 96 or more percent of the bounty of the coast. So we have this social order where these rich folks who lucked out getting a license or who just had the money to buy a license from people who wanted to cash out. They're the ones who are prioritized. We're only allowed to sell 4% wow. and that's of each kind. Um, and you need to have the experience. You need to have the right equipment. You need to have so much gear that people yeah. haven't been able to have because it's really expensive. It's crazy expensive to run a boat. Mm -hmm. And from, from what I see, this, this kind of framework is, it's specifically upholding the Canadian history of oppressing indigenous folks and preventing massive prosperity. I, I, see, I see it as like, uh, it's, it's been done for 150 years from slaughtering of the buffalo by, I don't know how many were slaughtered. I think it was a million buffalo slaughtered on the plains. And just all these different things that have been used specifically to make sure that we aren't living our best lives. This is the thing, like we should we want a society where we can do that, right? Where we can live our best lives. Um, and, and when I hear that term moderate livelihood, I think, well, kind of sounds like they want you to live a subsistence lifestyle, <laughs> you know? Um, and one of the side issues here uh, about the, the what they call the moderate living fishery, which I don't know, it's problematic in my own head. I'm trying to sort through it, but is it they can't sell the catch? Yeah, that, just, that's 
that's what's going on right now is that fisheries, uh, Department of Fisheries and Oceans, they can't bust the fishermen. There's been too many cases, Juan, uh, the New Chalneth, the Sparrow decision, um, the one on the East Coast. I think there's six, six Supreme Court cases where First Nations people won and the Supreme Court ordered the government to let us have our way with these things. So the precedent is that we are winning. So fisheries, they don't have the jurisdiction to mess with us anymore. They used to all the time. They would board your boat and they would always have a sidearm with them. It was yeah. just this giant, angry white dude who hated the hell out of fishermen because they didn't need licenses to food fish. Yeah. And so you just have this angry government official, just a massive dude with a pistol, and he's standing there questioning you and looking for something to bust you on. Um, I can't remember what the fine was for, but uh, to have a certain license, it was like an $800 fine or something like that. And then it was $800 to get the license. So it was just, it was just wild how mm -hmm. punitive it was. And like they would, if your flares were expired, you would be charged for that. If your life jacket was expired, they would cut it. It's like, how is cutting a life jacket helping somebody's life? That's literally the opposite yeah. of keeping people safe. No, like if you want to be real. Yeah. Like if you wanted people to be safe, you like providing them with a life jacket, <laughs> providing them with maybe oh, a coupon for a life jacket, not cutting it and saying, all right, idea. here's like a fine. Yeah. Yeah. But that's what, that's what DFO is actually doing here. You know, um, it's what they were doing with, with Butlekeck in, um, in Cape Breton, right? They just like seizing their traps. Yeah. You know, um, that happened to my uncle too, actually. I don't know how many years ago, uh, my late uncle, he was, he was one of the best fishermen in our village easily. And he had 4,000 pounds and fisheries seized it. And they kept it and they took it and they froze it. But then after a while, they had no legal jurisdiction to do that. So they had to give it back. <laughs> I love that. <laughs> and uh, that, that happened to another guy. This guy, he's like, the biggest dirt bag in our village and uh but he, he works hard but he's just a dirt bag but uh he had his fish seized too and i think fisheries didn't freeze it or something i don't know what happened but they ended up having to compensate him because it went bad because <laughs> it went bad they didn't have the right to take his fish they took it and then they were like, oh, shit, this isn't going to look good. This is bad. <laughs> we don't have, we literally don't have the right to do this to this guy. We literally just took this guy's work <laughs> and destroyed it. Wow. And then they had to compensate him. And what DFO does here is like they fly in a plane and they take pictures of fishermen all the time. Um, usually it's on the, uh, the outside waters. So where, where it's pretty rough, not as not often in the inside, but on the yeah. outside where it's rough, they fly there all the time taking pictures. And that dude, when, uh, when they had to compensate him, he went into their office and he walked out with a check and they showed him an inch thick file on him. They knew everything about him. They spent so much time and money surveilling him. And it really just... Uh, it just shows where their priorities are. It's about, it's not about making things better for anybody. It's not about sustainability. It's not for um, anything. It's upholding the social order of preventing indigenous prosperity and preventing rich folks getting richer off of our yeah. bounty that should, that should make us an incredibly wealthy people. Yeah. <laughs> Marshall decision is that one of the ones you're thinking of from yeah. earlier on in this whole yeah. Yeah. struggle? Yeah, yeah. the yeah. Marshall Marshall decision and the Spain uh, the uh, Sparrow yeah. decision. Yeah, yeah, I was thinking about Marshall. That was '99, so Sparrow was earlier than that, right? Uh, yeah, Sparrow was the night uh, in '90. Okay, so yeah, nine years before. Yeah. Well, I mean, Donald Marshall Jr. had been arrested fishing eel 
and that you know that's where that whole thing started and the funny thing is i mean his defense was ultimately the treaty that were that guaranteed their rights you know and the supreme court upholds the um upholds that but that's also when they inserted this moderate livelihood thing and and that was the kind of the outlier of that whole decision um and i think the piece that 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 gets like the the the, the trap in it so you recognize the treaty rights, but you introduce this clause um, that's guaranteed to generate conflict and arguments when you <laughs> try to assert it. Oh, gosh. Right? Well, um, it'll be interesting when CEOs of big capitalist corporations are told they can only make a moderate livelihood. <laughs> <laughs> oh, <gosh. laughs> you can only have one yacht. I'm sorry. <laughs> Oh, and then when we get together and then they say, oh, well, we'll put together a council to decide on what a moderate livelihood is. And then we'll send it to another council and then we'll send it to some bureaucrats and then it'll sit on some guy's office for six months. Yeah, yeah. And, and this is the thing, you know, uh, is that actually it, you have to return to this point, which is that that's already been negotiated, right? There's a, there's a deal that was made. Yeah. Yeah, and, that, and like we the won. Reason. There's no contesting that we won, but they mm -hmm. have the the jurisdiction to what to bring it to semantics and say, "Well, we don't know about this. What is this? We'll just put it on the back burner for now." Yeah. Meanwhile, the people need moderate livelihoods. <laughs> Poverty <laughs> is a huge, huge, huge problem among First Nations folks. Yeah, and exactly. The fishing industry was so good for them for so long, but all that prosperity is slowly but surely uh, been monopolized and taken over. And that's the story over and over and over again throughout the settler states and all the places where once upon a time there was prosperity and then capitalism came and siphoned it all, yep. leaving just crumbs for the left, for the rest. One big Hoover vacuum. Yeah. There we was, have a... Uh, we have another question uh, from our viewers here. So I'll ask each of you to, to talk about this. Uh, what's the best way we can show solidarity and support with indigenous fishers uh, across the nation? Uh, so who wants to, to go first? We'll give you both uh, time at this one. We're getting close to the end of our uh, online event here today. I'll let Chris tackle that first. Yeah. <laughs> Go ahead, Chris. I was hoping to riff off of you, man. <laughs> no, um, I don't know. I, what I will say is that um, uh, we had lots of debates. Uh, um, this is amongst, <laughs> I'll just call it uh, the settlers up here, uh, about that very question. Like, what should we be doing um, in the instance of, um, of the... Uh, uh, the conflict in Digby, and there were people who, you know, wanted to go down and and do whatever down there. Um, but uh, but the position that prevailed here in this particular conflict was was that the basic the basics of solidarity is that you you it's 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 whatever indigenous people need us to do is what you do. So um, you know, so so at one point the uh, the problem. Uh, was uh, was getting the um, was getting the uh, federal politicians to even act. So, so our Mi'kmaq allies, our friends, said, just start calling, start writing letters. You know, and I'm not a big fan of of you know I don't have a lot of faith in bourgeois democracy, but in this instance, it's the sort of thing that will move some of the political pieces. And so we've got a role that we can play. And the point was made over and over and over again is that these are your elected officials. You need to hold them accountable for the way that they're, they're behaving. And that much is true. So, uh, so that's what we can do. Um, the other thing is that we tend to have as settlers some deeper pockets. So we can pony up and we can make donations to the cause um, because in this case, Traps are being destroyed, boats were being burned, um, uh, uh, Mi'kmaq fishers were being denied um, access to services and uh, were not allowed into stores. I mean, it was pretty heavy shit uh, for a very long time. 
So donations, whatever you could put together. So we, we raised material goods, we raised money um, and then delivered it. Um, it wasn't our job to, to be on the wharf. Our job was to, to collect the material um, goods that made it possible for Mi'kmaq fishers to continue that struggle. So, so, so to me, it's very practical, very pragmatic. You can make lots of speeches, but at the end of the day, it's what you're putting together, how much money you're raising, how much gear you're collecting and making it possible for, um, for our Mi'kmaq friends to actually prevail, which I think they have. Um, but that's, that's their victory, not ours, but, um, but we have that obligation. We're part of that treaty. This is what most settlers here don't understand that this is not not obligations and, and rights that are conferred upon Mi'kmaq, it's part, it's us too. So our job is to defend those treaties and to defend um, the inherent right of indigenous peoples and in mainly in whatever way those indigenous peoples decide it's what they need in the moment. It's not our job to make those decisions, our job is to, is to act. So, but that also means developing a relationship with the communities that you, that are your neighbors too. So. So that's the other piece of it. Beautiful. Yeah, part of that is learning what's in those treaties, Chris. Yes. We all need to, to read the books. There's a lot of stuff has come out about yeah. you know, what the actual meaning of the numbered treaties is. Uh, all of us that come from the prairies need to, to know yeah. that history. But Jim? For that, I don't have a great deal of answers, but there's two two big things that I would recommend or three things that um, the first would be the easiest I would think depending on your relationships but I think talking to your family talking to co-workers and just bringing up these things knowing a little bit about it and be able to talk about it instead of um, just repeating racist beliefs that are perpetuated and pushed on in order to keep indigenous folks oppressed it's so integral to be able to, to halt a belief, to halt, some, to halt a harm and to stop that from being pushed on, especially with your loved ones. I, I feel like um, it's absolutely critical to, to, to share the warmth with people, yeah. to share the truth with them so they can, they can know the actual truth of the matter. They can, they can be empathetic and sympathetic and they say, man, holy, that's brutal. Instead of just believing heinously violent things. Um, so talking with your family members, talking with your coworkers, and then just the second thing I would think is supporting whatever is going on right now, whatever indigenous movements, just send, find a, find a link, send whatever money you can. 10 bucks, 20 bucks, and then mention it to somebody and just say, oh yeah, as soon as they're, it, it, when you do that and somebody's mentioning something racist and they're repeating some BS, you can say, oh yeah, this is what it's actually about. I sent 50 bucks. These people are having this right infringed on them. I think uh, grassroots support uh, talking to your family members and financial support are pretty much the three keys to supporting um, fishing rights here. But it, yeah. e it even, and those things, those extend to other things beyond fishing. That's, that extends right to Indigenous sovereignty, where whatever struggles going on, find something that's going on and, and support it and talk to folks. Because co colonization has never ended. It's ongoing and it's still our fight. We need to fight it if we're to save our planet and to stop it from being cooked alive. Very true. Absolutely. Uh, we're about at the end of our session here. Uh, thanks very much for those words of wisdom, Jim. That's uh, uh, something we all need to take to heart. Uh, the, the struggles that go on here in British Columbia against the, uh, the pipelines, against the Site C dam, against the LNG products. Uh, all of us uh, who are uh, taking part in this today need to uh, renew our commitment to, to actual 
solidarity with those struggles uh, when uh, the roads are blocked outside the, the Center for Socialist Education uh, here and that happens, uh, yeah, it happens more when it's not COVID times, but we need to make sure that we continue to open our doors to let people have a warm place to come and have a cup of coffee and, uh, and also be out there on the street with them and supporting them whichever way that we can. Is there any final words from either of you about uh, our topic here today? I, I certainly want to thank both of you for uh, being so generous with your time, your ideas, your, your experience, your knowledge. Um, I have one joke about Canada. A joke right. about Canada? <laughs> yeah. It's a funny country. Go ahead. <laughs> so natives like to joke that Canada is three corporations in a trench coat. It's one of my favorite jokes, but it's... It's so accurate that it's hard to call it a joke. The Queen, the Hudson's Bay Company, and its rivals used the RCMP to crush Indigenous sovereignty, and they declared this place Canada 150 or four years ago. But I think a more accurate view of Canada being three, trench, three corporations in a trench coat, I think we should look at Canada as 100 people, five natives, six oil barons, seven mining corporations, eight bureaucrats, nine cops, and the queen. <laughs> uh, <laughs> hard to top that one, Chris. Uh, <laughs> no, I'm not even going to try. <laughs> You're not going to try. In that case, I want to thank everybody who's uh, uh, watched us here today. I assume this will be posted on YouTube somewhere, you can tell your friends uh, if you thought this was a, a worthwhile event to please come and, uh, and check it out. Uh, thanks to uh, our technical support, Kayla, who helped uh, get this off the ground, Jane, who also helped, and in particular, Jay Watts in Toronto. Uh, much respect to you, Jay, for, uh, for helping uh, us technically challenged people uh, to hold this together and uh, and put it up online for people wherever you are. We know we had folks as far away as uh, Aotearoa, New Zealand, who said they were going to be watching this. And I'm sure there's you know others from other parts of the world as well as across Canada. So uh, goodbye to everyone and uh, you know, look for other events that we'll be announcing in, uh, in the coming period. It's been a pleasure. Thank you for having me. Okay. Thanks for having me too. It's been awesome. Great. Uh, you can take us away, Jay. Shut us off. <laughs> okay.